Hello, Daxus, Matthias. Hello, how's it going? Hello. Good, good. Uh, okay. I think that was slinky. <coughs> and uh, Remy. Hey there. Yes. Hey, Remy. Hey. hey. For once that I did something. <laughs> We may have a, yeah, go ahead. No, I'll talk to you later. Okay. Yeah, we may have a, a very small call today because of the vacations in the U.S. Hey, Timur. Hey, Doug, how are you? Good, good. Hello, Heinz. Hello. Good to hear from you guys again. Yeah, it's been a while for you. Yeah, well, between vacations and those nasty clients, I got a little sidetracked, but I'm back. <laughs> those darn paying customers. Man, what are you going to do? I tell you, life would be so good if it wasn't for stinking <laughs> users. <laughs> yep. Hey, Tommy. Hey. Hmm. Hi there. Oh, hey, Mark. How's it going? Doing great. That's good. 
<laughs> Holiday tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be nice to uh, you know have that extra time to stay at home. <laughs> More dad humor. I like it. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny, I'm, I'm seeing that phrase dad humor more and more, and I'm trying to figure out whether we should be offended by this or not. <laughs> I feel like they're making fun of us. Bad to courage. Yeah. Hey, Christoph. Hey. Hey, Scott. Morning. Gustavo? Oh, no, I doesn't have a microphone yet. Christian, are you there? Hey, good morning. Hello, and Colin? Good morning. Hello. Ryan, are you there? Yes, good morning. Hello. Jim. Hello. Hello. Did you get any uh, feedback from your question about setting up a meeting for the protobuf stuff? Negative. Negative. I hate silence. <laughs> hey, Eric. Hey, Dan. Do, 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 do. Um. Okay, one more minute, then I'll get started. Tell you what, why don't we go ahead and get started now? Uh, maybe make it a very quick call. Okay, anything from the community if you want to bring up that's not on the agenda. Okay. Um, SDK call, we'll have one right after this one. I don't think we talked about anything too important last week other than uh, some of the PRs around the governance and stuff like that. Um, I think there may have been some minor changes made since then. Is there anybody from the SDK uh, sub team that can think of anything worth mentioning? Uh, I'd like to talk about like the discovery integration or not, or creating a side one, but uh, maybe it's not for this call, I guess. Yeah, that's a good topic. So um, let's put that down here, because I think that's a good topic for this phone call, not just the SDK call. OK? Yeah, sure. Cool. Okay. Um, in that case, moving forward, uh, Timur, anything you want to bring us up to date with, relative to the uh, workflow stuff? Hey guys. Yeah, I mean, uh, the last two weeks, sorry, I missed last week's meeting. Uh, we've been working on SDK, so we added a Go SDK and there is a PR for a Java SDK. So those two, uh, that's what we've been mainly doing. And yeah, those are the main things. Cool, that's exciting. Any questions? Yeah, I mean, also another thing I wanted to just mention if anybody's interested or could help us with, if you guys have any experience 
with Kubernetes uh, custom resource definitions. We've added those in uh, just to kind of uh, added the go type so you can create your CRDs uh, that are spec based types that, that are based on our workflow definitions. But we're kind of looking just, you know, for help from individuals that know this stuff better just for review. And we're also talking to Argo to get help with that because they're kind of experts on that. But if anybody on this team also knows this stuff pretty well, it would be really nice to have your opinion and have you look at it. Sorry, I talked too much, but yeah. No, I, I know there are some people on the call who have a lot of experience with CRDs, but I don't want to call them out unless they don't want to do it. So uh, anybody want to volunteer to speak up? Okay. Um, Actually, this is Vinay here. Yeah, Vinay. Uh, I, I, I can. Um, I'm happy to. Where exactly is this? Uh, uh, is there like a? Is it in the spec or is it in? Yeah, I'll link, I'll link in the chat just for uh, in a second, and then you have Tanya. Thank you so much. Just an yeah. overview. Thank sure you. thing. And somebody's smiling in the chat room, so take that for whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, before we jump into PRs, anything else on the agenda that I forgot to add that people think we should talk about? All righty, in that case, let's jump on to this one. Let's see who was this? So this was Lance. If I remember correctly, I don't see him on the call. If I remember correctly, this one was more of a copy of the general guidelines that he had written up for the JavaScript SDK, I believe. And he just wanted to put this out there as a proposal for SDKs, for the other SDKs to possibly pick up. I don't think it requires them to pick it up. I think it's just sort of general guidelines that, that are good if they're looking for a sort of like a rough draft starting point for their own SDK work. Um, but I thought uh, because this is going to land in the cloud events repo itself and not an SDK repo, I felt like it was from a process perspective, it had to get bumped up to us to, to take a quick look at it and give everybody here a chance to review it. So even though he's not on the call, are there any questions about this one? Any of the SDK folks have any issues with this? Uh, Jim, your hands up. I was just wondering how much of this is specific to SDKs and how much of it can be applied to the you know, our process, I guess. Um, I don't think it's necessarily SDK specific, but I'm not sure it necessarily applies to our process because the way we deal with PRs is very different, right? Okay. Um, right? We, we, we don't follow a normal code PR style thing, right? We only do things on Thursdays and stuff like that. So it's, I'm not quite sure it applies to us from that perspective. So this is more just setting expectations from, you know, uh, trusted committers and stuff like that? that yeah, right? that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, how do you label your commit messages or how you label your PRs and stuff like that? It's just things that I think are more important for PR processes where you're merging PRs on a daily basis kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any qu other questions, comments? Any objections then to approving that one? All right, done. Thank you, everybody. Whoa. All right, whoa, hold on, I hit the wrong key. All right, next one, I think, Francesco, this one might be yours. So you get to actually describe this one, if you would. Uh, so this one is an action item that I took two weeks, three weeks ago. Uh, and it basic, uh, it's basically a draft uh, that talks about um, a management, uh, community management of the SDK projects. In particular, it goes through uh, the problem of security patches, ensuring the project health even when the maintainers are not available, and how we want to handle situ mm, corner case situations like an endeavor of a project to a new maintainer where the previous maintainers are not available anymore. And the other corner case is uh, when the community wants to archive a project. And at the end of the document, there is a section that explains a voting process uh, for this corner case situations and for changing the document itself. So. 
Okay. Yeah, I also I also de uh, decided to don't go through the new maintainer discussion because it it deserves a separate PR, in my opinion. Okay. Any questions or comments? And so keep in mind, this process is just for the SDKs, but we thought it would be important to have sort of an overarching process for how to manage the SDKs themselves, since we're a little bit loosey-goosey on that. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, is this, um, I like the, I love the idea, but, and also is this a process of uh, determining if uh, the liveliness of the project in line with other projects uh, that have been out there? I'm just curious. Francesco, did you want to take that one? Uh, okay, can you repeat, please? Because I didn't. Uh, the, I guess the question is: uh, is the process that you've outlined here? Um, uh, I, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. So I'm just curious: uh, how do other very popular open source projects determine liveliness, and is it uh, is it similar? So, what I took the voting process actually from another. Another community I'm part of. Um, part of. Uh, well, for the elders, I basically took inspiration from the discussion we had during the SDK meetings. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. For this voting, the voting process that I proposed is a voting process that to, I use in another community. So, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Concerns? And keep in mind, um, if there is something in here that we find just doesn't quite work right, we obviously can change it later on. Um, we'll learn as we go. With, a, with, a vo with the voting process. Itself. Yes, with the voting process, yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yes. Enough way to use it. <laughs> yeah. All right, any objection then to approving? I'm not hearing anybody raise their hands or see anybody raise their hands. All right, no objection. Thank you, Francesco, for doing that. I appreciate it. Hey, Lance. All right, schema registry. I can't remember who opened this one. Thomas. I don't see Thomas on the call. So let me see if I can refresh my memory. Oh, so this is a minor one. Does anybody know? I think this is Open API. He uh, according to the editor or checker or something like that he was using, it was complaining about missing quotes. Now I did see examples where it showed both ways, with and without the quotes. Um, but does anybody have any reason to believe that adding quotes would be a bad thing? Just want to give everybody a chance to speak up if they had any opinion on this one. Francesco? It should be the same for every YAML parser, I think. Meaning quotes are okay or quotes are not yeah, okay? Yeah, quotes are okay. Okay, <laughs> just checking. Okay. Some might try to interpret that as a, a flow. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. From the spec, it's a, it's a string, so yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. In that case, any objection to approving that one? Perfect. Thank you, everybody. All right. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Never mind. Um, I need to document myself. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, this one, oh, um, somebody, I can't remember who it was, uh, I guess Andreas, um, he, he had some comments about, um, about the primer and the actions that we, or the, um, the types in there. He was bothered by the fact that some of these things were in, did not, were not in past tense in our adapters and the adapters are not formal specifications, so they are allowed to change at any time. And I thought that um, one is the couch DB one should probably change to be past tense. Cause I thought that, that seemed to make a whole lot of sense. Cause when I looked at all the other uh, types that we had for the other adapters like GitHub and, and the other ones in there, they all were in the past tense as well. So I thought following that pattern made a whole lot of sense. But then the other thing I did here is I actually updated our examples um, from fake GitHub things to actually line up with our rec recommended adapter types for GitHub. So that's all these other ones were, was just to align it. Um, and then I made this one past tense as well. 
So these are just simple typos kind of things in my opinion. The only thing that might be questionable is whether anybody has any objection to changing the CouchDB adapter to be past tense for the verbs that we have in there. I think they should be past tense. Otherwise they come across as instructions, not events. That's exactly his argument as well, yes. Yep. Which is why it made sense to me. Okay, any other questions or comments on this one? Any objection to approving then? Okay, go thank you, it. it should all, say it again? I said go for it. Okay, cool. This all should be non-normative anyway, so shouldn't that be controversial? All right, now this one, um, I can't remember why this popped up in our conversation, but I think it popped up in the SDK call. Someone noticed that we didn't have any code of conduct governance docs um, in the SDKs, then we realized, well, we don't actually have one for the main project itself. Oh, I remember why this came up, I think. I think because the workflow uh, is going through Sandbox project, they didn't have a code of conduct, and that's when we realized we didn't have it for our stuff over here. So we thought, okay, um, since every CNCF project is actually supposed to um, have a COC, and we didn't, we should probably do that to keep ourselves aligned. So basically what I did was I copied the code of conduct document from the CNCF project itself. And that's all it is down here. And I just changed, um, I don't think I really changed anything. Actually, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Contributing, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, what I did was I added a pointer to the code of conduct from the CNCF thing. I didn't actually copy it in here. But then at the same time, what I did is I, did a whole bunch of little cleanup things. I just thought this whole section about our meeting times was just kind of ugly. So I just reformatted that, nothing changed really there. But then what I did is I moved um, some of our documents, like our governance doc into our community directory. This was sort of my attempt at a first phase of cleaning up our, our directory structure. We had, in my opinion, or we have in my opinion, way too many things at the top level. So I wanted to push as many things as possible into subdirectories and I thought I'd start with the governance doc while I was messing around with this stuff anyway. So I moved the governance doc into community and did some cleanup. And then when I was changing the links, I had to reformat this because this went over 80 characters. Um, most of this was reformatting mainly because of either cleanup or because things moved in the governance directory or community directory. Um, and I removed the coming soon here because we already have a demos uh, file. So the words coming soon made no sense. Anyway, the biggest thing here was a pointer to Where's our governance doc? This section right here, this is the biggest thing. This information, we adhere to the CNCF's code of conduct document and we just point directly, directly to that. Um, that's about it, I don't know. Any questions on this, any concerns? Any objection? Okay, what I'm probably gonna do based upon what I think I grew to last week on the SDK call was, I'll then open up PRs <clears throat> um, in each of the SDKs to point to something, either our governance doc or to the CNCF COC. But either way, each SDK needs a COC as well. So I'll open up PRs in each of the in individual SDKs to talk about those or to add references to something. All right, uh, moving forward. Now these, these issues, I'm sorry, these PRs are, um, are too new for us to approve um, but I wanted to give an opportunity for any of the authors of these to talk about them if they wanted to. Yeah, I would like because for the implementation, uh, <laughs> it is useful to be sure that I'm not misleading. Uh, well, but, that's talking about this stuff down here, right? Uh, yeah, it's just because. Yes, yeah, so let, let's hold off on that. I want to talk just about these first. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Cool. But yeah. uh, it was like the second one, that's why I was saying that. Yeah. Okay, well, so first, Jem, did you want to talk about yours? I think this is yours. Did you want to talk about this one at all? Uh, sure. I, it's, uh, so somebody opened an issue um, because the, the JSON schema definition didn't seem to be uh, following the spirit of the uh, JSON format specification. Um, so the way the schema had originally been defined was that the data def object could be well, data def could be either an object or a string. Uh, but if you read the format spec, it says that data could be a va any valid JSON object. So 
um, I basically extended it the the type you know possible types just to cover all the um, types that that JSON supports. So it means that data def can, in this case, just be the word null or be true or or an array or the value fifty six or forty two, whichever is your favorite number. Okay. Okay, uh, too soon to approve this, but are there any high level questions or comments on this? Okay, please when you get a chance, take a look at that. Uh, make sure Jem did not go off the deep end. And Remy, I believe you wanted to quickly talk about this one. Yeah, uh, just while doing the implementation uh, is just I suppose it was typo because it's an array and obviously it's a map. So I just changed this. But I wanted to make sure that <laughs> it was not a misunderstanding from my side. Yeah. No, I think I just goofed when I wrote this up. I think I think you're right. I think it does make more sense as a map as opposed to an array. Yeah. Uh, at least with that structure, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whole bunch of reasons, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. As long as we are fine, it's fine. <laughs> Yep. Okay. Any questions on this one? Too soon to approve, but any questions? All right. Um, where's my cursor? Okay. This one, I can't remember who wrote up this one. Grant. Okay. This one's interesting. Um, so Grant noticed that in our spec, uh, we talk about how there's binary and structured mode. And in particular, do, 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 where is it? Somewhere in here. Okay, maybe it's not right here, but somewhere in our spec, there's, there's language that implies there's only two. But then the HTTP spec goes off and defines other ones, in particular batched. So he thought we needed to add additional text here to make it clear that other protocol bindings may be defined. Okay, and I think that was the motivation behind it. And I see um, uh, Christoph, you had a some comment here or additional change. But anybody want to speak to this one? Have any concerns or any comments? Yeah, I also have the bigger comment on the PR itself and on the issue itself. Um, I agree it is very confusing. Um, and I tried to explain it uh, in the uh, issue, but I think I failed at explain it, explaining it properly. So I think what the HTTP spec defines is another mode, but it's not a message mode. So for the message, you can have a binary or a structured mode. And the batch thing is also a structured mode because the definition fits. So in the batch modes, the event is fully encoded using a standalone event format and stored in the message body. That is actually true for the batch mode. So I think what is really confusing here is if you look at the binary modes, the binary mode is then in the binary mode, the message body is exactly the same as the request or response body that we sent. But if you look at, for example, batch, this is not the case. And if you look at um, other events formats, like, I don't know, Kafka, uh, the Azure event grids, pops up, whatever, then this is actually not the case. So we have the, um, the event format, which defines I'm taking the event and I'm transforming it into a message. And then the uh, protocol binding comes and says, okay, here's how you put this a message into the transport and then add additional stuff for the request or response body. And if you, have, if you see it as a two-step process, then the message mode only applies for the first step. And then the, for example, batching only applies for the second step. I'm not sure if I now lost everybody or not. <laughs> do, you, um, do, you think it's so yeah. to, do you think it's fair to say that there are two modes, binary and structured, but maybe there are different flavors of, of structured? Yeah, that's basically what I try to say with my uh, suggestion there. So um, you may have a protocol binding that has multiple structured modes. 
So if you, you could have one that doesn't batch and you could have one that batches, then you have two structured modes defined, which we actually do in the HTTP binding. Right. Okay, so this is, I think it's more a question of just finding the right wording, not necessarily introducing other modes, but finding the right wording to imply that that one structured mode that we defined is not the only one that can be defined. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah I would say so. Okay, I think that makes sense. Anybody else want to chime in here? Okay, so I, let's I, I have, sorry, well, go, go ahead, Ryan, yeah. Sorry, Doug. Um, I, I, I think um, the, the point you brought up about the, 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 the logical message being separate from how it is transmitted in a given protocol is, is interesting. Um, that's, that's one thing I've, I've struggled with, um, just looking at the spec and mapping it to different transports um, is the, the message is the same and, and you know, some transports don't have a metadata layer um, uh, and only have a message layer, um, but how the data is actually encoded, um, irregardless of that, um, can sometimes uh, depend on the specific protocol. So I think that's, that's an interesting thought there. Uh, Scott? I'm not sure the motivation for this change, but I, I kind of assume that it's related to pubs of push over HTTP would like to carry a cloud event, but they have no control over additional headers and the shape of the request. Is, is, that, is the attempt to uh, include HTTP for PubSub encoding so that we can decode a cloud event as, as a PubSub push format? I, I, I personally can't answer that one. Anybody else? Christoph, you, you read this too. What would uh, be your response to Scott? I, it could be that it's, he didn't specify it, I think. The, the shape of that request doesn't match up with uh, what Cloud Events defines. And there's no way to add custom headers. So the only way to actually understand if it's a Cloud Event is to attempt to unpack it first. And it's complicated. I mean, um, okay, I don't know the details of it, but it sounds like it's simply not the HTTP spec it follows, but it may be if you do an own pop sub specification, then you can still use the uh, JSON event format. Does that well, make but sense? It's over HTTP, so the, the only thing that at play at that mode is HTTP. Um, you okay. Yeah, you, you maybe may, it's Scott, you may want to take a look at his original issue because I can't remember for sure, but I have this vague recollection that when I first read it, I think he was just more bothered by the fact that the spec only talks about two things and he thought there were three things, meaning there are two modes and then the HTTP spec goes off and defines another one. So I think he was just having a mental problem with the spec saying there's two of something and then we immediately go off and define a third one. And he thought that was just inconsistent. At least I thought that's what he was really focused on. I don't think it actually impacts any of his coding that he's doing, but I could oh. be wrong. Okay. But yeah, t take a look at the original issue and see, maybe I, I might be remembering inc incorrectly. Okay. Anyway, we don't, you know, this one's too soon to approve here anyway. Um, but if there are other questions, you know, please raise it in the, either the PR or the original issue and maybe we can get Grant on the next week's call to talk to it again or talk to it if he uh, doesn't answer it through the issue. Okay. Anything else on this one people want to talk about? All righty. Um, Jim, I assume you don't want to talk about your protobuf, right? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Francesco, you don't want to talk about these two yet, right? No. No. Okay. All right. So let's talk about implementation of the discovery spec. So Remy, you had a topic here that you wanted to bring up. <laughs> so let's see, what was it? SDK, I think it was, was it JavaScript, JavaScript or Java? JavaScript. 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 
Um, so yeah, basically when I was implementing it, uh, at first we were thinking of uh, doing a separate SDK. Uh, and then I realized like first that the definition of uh, new types might be useful, uh, even if the normal SDK, just having the interface of what is a service, what is a type. Uh, sorry, my daughter is playing in the background. <laughs> if you hear a weird noise, it's me. Um, and then I was like, when I will, when I develop new services, uh, I just like basically by importing the cloud event SDK, I uh, was thinking it would be nice to do, just have like the discovery feature included in that SDK because then I don't have to add several uh, layers of SDKs. Um, so that's why I did integrate it in that one. I can split it again, but um, it, it made more sense to me at that time. Uh, and also because like I needed the, the definition, of course, of the primary SDK. Uh, so that's why uh, I did it this way, but I'm really open to re-split it. Uh, and also I, I tried to minimize the impact uh, so when you look, there is not that, like there is no dependency to Express, even if I include Express uh, to make it run. I can demo if you want to demo. Uh, I didn't really prepare, but I can do that uh, during the SDK call uh, if you want. But basically, the full uh, discovery API is working with the filtering and all those. So in the sample, uh, you see how I see the usage of it. Um, if you can go to that. I'm a, have I lost everyone? Or? No, we're here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm not used to those uh, huge silence like you. <laughs> Sometimes this group is really, really quiet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, basically here you, you just put like the register services. So you de define your different services. And uh, then uh, to, to make it uh, served, you just do the discovery service express. If you are running an express app on Node.js to serve the full uh, API. And another question that I raised while implementing is uh, in the spec, we say that the permission needs to be applied on each entity. And if you go back up a bit, yeah. So here in the type, that means basically I apply permission both on the service, but when the service uh, answer with different types of events, I also apply permission on, on that array of types uh, to allow you to basically um, like, uh, uh, to basically filter those as well. So it will send you the, like the cat service. If you only have permission for widget create, it will display the cat service with only the, the event connect widget create and remove all the events that you should not see, which I guess was the intent of the, of the specification, but I wanted to be sure. Hmm. Uh, Francesco, your hands up. Yeah, so um, I have a question uh, as a new above the Discover spec. I went through it, but uh, nothing more than that. So uh, first of all, your implementation is both client side and server side, or it's just one of the two? It's just one of the two. It's just a server side. Basically, it's just to serve uh, to like client what is available. Okay, uh, now my, my second question is, um, does the discovery spec hardly, let's say, hardly depends on the cloud event entity? So, I would say no, uh, because at the end I uh, had to define the cloud event type and the cloud event service which are really close to what exists in the SDK, but they are not directly uh, like derivated from it. But uh, no, no. Uh, I, maybe I did the wrong question. Uh, what I mean is to, to implement the discovery service, to implement the discovery spec, do you need the cloud event entity? So no, uh, no, I don't think that the thing is when you look at all the definitions, some of them kind of overlap. So my, my general thinking is maybe at one point, you could uh, 
basically have common definition. Uh, like if you look, in, I can probably turn. Some example when you define um, like the schema, or the definition of a schema inside an object, it could be an interface by itself that you extend because the definition of a schema is the same between a cloud event, the cloud event type, and uh, and those things. So I I think they are related to each other. So can you build it uh, independently? Yes, I guess. Uh, it's not even. Yeah, that that sure. was my question in the end. <laughs> but. Uh, does it make sense to make it independent? In my opinion, they have related uh, topics in some area. So I would tend to, at least on the type side, to merge them on the type. But again, uh, just my <laughs> opinion. <laughs> yes, so, oh, Francesco, did you have more to say? Uh, no, well, uh, the, the, the thing is that if my, my, my answer, but I think you, yeah, you replied, uh, is that does it make sense for the user to bring in a full cloud event SDK when what it just needs is the discovery spec to discovery service? So. Yeah, that's, that's, I'm, I was trying to do something similar in the sense that as a client, I could almost understand a single SDK knowing how to deal with receiving cloud events and how to talk to the discovery service to find out what, what services that are there and how to subscribe to them. So I, I can almost understand a possibly merging client side stuff because they kind of go hand in hand. The server side though, that's a little less clear to me. I can't, I, I'm having trouble struggling why somebody who is hosting a discovery service would care at all about it, about basically cloud events. Uh, uh, for me, like in the way I want to implement cloud events in uh, my company, as a, like a global uh, bus, we say, uh, I don't picture any, an application that will consume cloud events but never generate any cloud event. So it's kind of, there is a high chance that a service that will uh, provide some cloud events will as well uh, like basically consume other cloud events. So that's why I didn't make that much of a difference. And the thing is the discovery, like the server part of the discovery uh, is about 100 line of code. So it's not like uh, huge, but that means the definition should be shared in that case. So maybe we can just leave the definition in the client part and then the server part integrate the definition from the client. I don't know, but like, uh, for me, the definition should be shared between the two services, the consumer and the server part. So in that case. Uh... <laughs> yeah. so, so to me, I think I, I can't figure out whether this is an SDK question or a question for the group at large, right? In terms of, should we look to merge any potential code uh, into one thing or keep them separate. Um, I think, I, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure who, who's best to answer that question. <laughs> um, maybe we should start with the JavaScript SDK folks and see what they think. Yeah, because like the thing is uh, then uh, we'll implement also the schema normally. Uh, and once we do that as well, uh, do we create another SDK for this one? Or because we could argue that maybe you just want to have the discovery, but not the schema and so on, so on. So same thing. Anybody from the JavaScript side of the house want to chime in here? Aside from Slinky? I am, um, this is Lance. Uh, I, I don't know, I, I like I need to, live with this for a little while and, and think about it and, and stew on it some. It was, I, I, I mean, I literally just saw this PR during this call um, <clears throat> and I need to think about what the implications are. Uh, so I guess that doesn't really help very much, but um, I, all I'm saying is that I can't say for sure yet. Okay. okay. Anybody else wanna chime in on the topic? of either this particular PR or just in general, how they viewed us managing potential code for the new specifications that are coming. 
I personally don't have a problem with it being in the SDK repos, as long as it's something that's uh, separatable. Okay, thank you, Scott. Just out of curiosity, if let's say um, it, they did live in the SDK repos, is it weird to have a server side component like a discovery service be under something called an SDK? Uh, sorry, you just said that? Reference. Say it again, Scott. I think the SDKs are intended to be reference implementations, right? Yeah. Uh, that's true. If you think of it that way, then yeah, I can buy that. Yeah, the, the thing also is like, it can serve the content, but it's not serving it by itself. Like it doesn't include any service, like server parts. It just include the code that can answer to a server implementation. So it's like a helper more than uh, the full implementation of the server side. Like, I mean, if you want to do it, you still need to run your own HTTP server and call that code. So it's not like, uh, I would uh, completely agree with you if there was like, uh, a full implementation of Express or like something that really run the serving part. But the SDK won't start listening on any part when you launch it. That's what I want to say. Okay. Lance, were you going to say something in there? You, you got shy uh, again. I, I mean, I guess I have a few just sort of unstructured thoughts. One is that it, like having these not in the SDK repository seems like it would just create a proliferation of new repositories because they're re really probably wouldn't it would be good if if it was these were implemented in more than one language right um and then uh, you know there's already uh networking code in these um sdks or at least in the javascript one uh to send and receive cloud events over http I'm not sure that this is really that much different um And it doesn't seem very big. Um, yeah, it's right. <laughs> it doesn't the size of the repository that much. So. OK. Well, that's good then. It doesn't seem to be a whole lot of resistance than at least considering it. Because I, I do agree with you, Lance. The proliferation of SDEV of the repos is, would be a bit of a concern. Yeah, that was my fear too. And uh, to answer to Slinky, uh, yeah, you're right. Like, we should do free, but then that means if we start doing like free repo, or <laughs> it's kind of hard to yeah. read for someone who just uh, joined the, the cloud events. Uh, I already had that kind of that struggle. Like, uh, when I start uh, pushing my team to look at uh, cloud events, I had like uh, tons of questions. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, the simpler, the better. Okay. So we'll see how, how this goes in the uh, JavaScript repo PR review. Uh, Slinky, your hands up. Oh, okay. Uh, um, I, I, as I said in comments, for, uh, I think it's fine to keep it, uh, to, to have one repo where we want to push all the code to implement our specs. Uh, but then, Let's not forget that we start having problems like uh, managing the versioning of the projects, uh, and, you know, stuff like that, which may be complicated at some point. So, uh, uh, as I said, he, 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 if Discover Spec doesn't depend on cloud events, then it's fine for me if we put, for example, in SDK Java, uh, some sub modules that doesn't depend on the cloud events modules. But then uh, at, uh, at that point, you start having the problem of having the same versioning for this project. Hmm. Do you see uh, what I mean? So mm -hmm. I'm okay with that, but let, let's think to it more carefully. For me, nothing is written in stone. I mean, uh, we can start no, by no, no, that. Okay. If we think course, that we need to mer like to change, we can divert pretty easily. So. Oh yeah, of course, of course. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay, cool. Thank you, Remy. Um, so as I was trying to play with implementing the discovery spec, there are two things that jumped out at me and I wanted to get people's opinions on these. First of all is pagination support. I realized that the number of services could be quite large, which typically then means some sort of pagination. And I was wondering whether 
um, anybody had any preference in terms of how to actually represent this on the wire? I saw uh, a couple of different flavors out there when I was just doing a quick search. Um, at the high level, I think there's this notion of like what GitHub does, which is they don't necessarily touch the body of the message. They add additional HTTP headers telling you how to get the next chunk. But then there are other implementations and it doesn't show up. Um, oh, maybe I didn't paste it here. There are, anyway, there are other, there are other implementations where um, it's actually part of the payload itself. So there's like an extra wrapper around the data that says, here's the previous, here's the next chunk if you wanna do that kind of stuff. Um, I personally have a preference for not touching the data itself, but I wanted to you know, hear from other people. And then the other aspect of it that I wanted to get people's opinions on is when you actually do the chunking, do we want to head down the path of it being, uh, assuming that things don't change very often, therefore you don't have to, as an implementation on the server side, you don't have to worry about some sort of transactional thing, right? Where you like run a query and then people iterate over the query set because your data is changing all the time. You don't want them to have their enumeration all you know, messed up because things keep changing. Or you know, do we say, no, it doesn't change very often, therefore we don't technically need to worry about this. But then the question is, when I notice things like this, it's like, okay, is the page size dictated by this number here, right? And that gets a little bit awkward because what if someone passes in, you know, I want just page three and page size is 50. Well, that's gonna influence your page sizes. And if the page size changes every single time you do a query, how does that, you know, how is that gonna work? You know, it, it could get kind of funky. Then I thought, well, okay, maybe it's more of just an opaque string that passes along and then the server side knows what to do with that opaque string and to figure out what the next chunk is gonna be, but then he has this persistent kind of state. Anyway, there are a whole bunch of different options that I saw out there and I just wanted to get people's opinions before I try to attempt to, to write a PR on this. So let me pause there and Ryan, I'll let you speak. Yeah, um, so, so I definitely have some, some opinions here. Um, I will say um, to, your, to your first question around whether the, um, the URL or the pointer to the next chunk of results should be in the metadata versus the, the payload. I am definitely in favor of, of the metadata. And I'm saying that as uh, at, at Twilio, we actually put it in a payload and that uh, has caused me a lot of personal heartache <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, that I can, I can try to explain um, uh, asynchronously when I have some time. Um, I think um, with regard to how the, um, that, that pointer um, and all the information that's required to get to that next chunk is encoded in the URL itself. My, my personal opinion is that we can't be too opinionated here because a lot of these things are very implementation specific. Um, so things like result size and also um, where in the results that you are, um, uh, different uh, you know, underlying systems and databases implement those differently and have, um, in my experience, different uh, performance characteristics. And I would personally rather not um, make assumptions about um, what the implementations are going to use um, and um, you know, start with more of the, the, the approach with an opaque string than um, breaking it up into um, th things that make assumptions about the, the implementation. Okay, thank you. Uh, Remy, your hands up. Uh, yeah, sorry, my daughter just spilled my coffee. <laughs> uh, I might have missed what you said. Uh, yeah, it's just for me, the server should be quite simple. So I would not uh, be in favor of like having a pack string or thing like that. I think if the client is messing around with the page size while he's browsing it, uh, it's his own fault. <laughs> I don't care if he's stupid. Uh, and I don't think those data should move that often in my opinion, even if you created new service, I don't expect people to have like a new service every five seconds. So I would consider that it's fine uh, not refreshing. And even if the result change, if by mistake you are browsing it during uh, a don't know, new push to production, so meaning new services, then it's kind of a faulty one, but uh, I don't think it's gonna change the, the full uh, behavior of the cloud events because obviously that means it's just new events or so also keep in mind this isn't for cloud events this is for the discovery spec 
Yeah, but I mean, for <laughs> okay, for me, the discovery spec is about uh, knowing what cloud events are on the service side. So, I mean, if you don't have that definition, like if that definition is a bit wrong at the moment you ask because there was a deployment in the meantime, I don't think it's a huge issue. Worst case, you just re query and you'll get the right answer. Okay. Um. Okay, well, thank you guys for your input. Uh, let me just ask some more, more directed questions. Just get your, your feeling on this. Should the client, I, I, think it's, I think it's important for the client to be able to say how many requests it could handle at a time, right? It may be a very resource constrained client and maybe you can only hand a, or handle a couple of services coming back at a time because the, the, the size of the service, each service chunk could technically be, be rather large. But does it make sense that the client be able to specify the number of items on every single step as it's iterating through everything? Meaning, should they be able to change it on each iteration or once they set it once for their queries, they're stuck with that, that size all the way through? Anybody have an opinion on that? I guess because what, what I'm kind of asking is whether the user should be able to change this number here on every single query. When that happens, usually there's a, some sort of hash of the element that you're referencing from, and then you wanna ask for a count. And at the end of the payload, there's, there's another reference to say where you are in the list. Rather than like a page, there's a, I'm at ABC123, I would like the next 100 elements. Right. I think that's, I think that's closer to what this is saying, right? This is saying this references the next element and I want the next 100 after that. Right. And that makes perfect sense to me. It's when you have situations like this, that it gets less clear to me, right? Is this saying I want the next 100 or each page size is 100 and I want the next 100 because that thing, right? Because if it's a page size, that's going to influence how big each page is. Right. Well, so consider the situation where you have a, a schema of, let's say, a, a hundred different things and 5% of them are giant schemas. Mm -hmm. So your, each page, even though I have the same amount of elements, will be dramatically different sizes. So I, I don't know if you want to talk about element counts or uh, payload size. That's a whole different aspect that I wasn't thinking about, but yeah. Okay, let me think more about that. Okay, anybody else want to chime in here with some thoughts for me to consider as I think about a PR for this? Okay. In that case, the other one that popped up as I was implementing it was I realized that as a client, if I'm periodically querying a discovery service just to see whether the list of services have changed, I need to be able to have a unique field, I'm sorry, a, an immutable field in each service to know that that field will never change because that way if it does change or it vanishes, I should say, then I can be assured that that service is gone. Now another one may have popped up with the exact same bit of metadata, you know, the exact same name, and everything else, but because of this unique field as is now no longer appears in the results set, I need to think of it as a completely new service, whatever that means from a client perspective, right? Um, and so what I was thinking was making the service name be that immutable field. Um, if we don't want name <clears throat> to be immutable because people may have fat fingered it and they wanna change it, then we may need to come up with a, a more normal immutable field like an ID and use that going forward and say, look, we don't actually use this for anything, but it, we need it there for this consistency check kind of thing or you know, newness check, whatever you want to call it. Anyway, I, I'd, like to, I'd like some input on that if you guys want to think about it and comment on the issue itself. But Jem, your hands up. It, the service name is informational, isn't it? I, presumably it's not it's probably more product related. Yeah, the, the events themselves presumably are gonna be pretty durable. You're not gonna, you know, discard an event type and then suddenly recreate it with a completely different 
schema attached to it. Um, so I could see, you know, as we always do, yeah, our product teams turning around and, you know, rebranding things uh, and putting, you know, events into different families. Uh, but I'm not quite sure what the intention of the value is. But it does raise an interesting point of, do we have the concept of life cycle anywhere? You know, so are we saying, um, is there a, re a representation of, you know, we're publishing this event, but it's deprecated and it will stop being emitted, you know, next July. Yeah, I think that's a slightly different topic, but I think it, it is, but it suddenly struck me when you're talking about changing things. Um, yeah. It led me down that road of, okay, well, what are the scenarios where you're going to change something or what would cause you to, you know, remove a service, for instance. And I, and I don't think you should be able to just blindly remove one without, you know, having at least the capability to say, oh, it, it's changing or it will be going away. Yeah. yeah. I think that might be worthy of a, a separate issue to bring up to have that, that, that have that discussion. Um, sure. So going back to this one, I, I think I'm leaning, if, if I understood you correctly, Jim, I think I'm leaning more towards what you were saying as, as being accurate, which is even if we expected the name to be kind of geeky and not necessarily human readable, because that's kind of what description is for, um, I, I just can't help but get the feeling that someone may change that name from time to time, right? It, um, you know, they may change their product name and therefore they want to stop calling it GitHub. They want to start calling it FooHub or something like that, right? But everything else stays the same and they want everybody to think of it as the same service. It's just they have, you know, if anybody shows this name in their, to their clients, so they want it to stop saying GitHub, right? Or something like that. So I'm leaning more towards saying each of these things needs to have a unique identifier that's immutable. And that's for no other purpose other than this, this check that we're talking about here. That way we don't have to worry about fat fingers or anything like that. Anyway, Remy, your hands up. Yeah, I don't, uh, so for me, uh, what I understand from it when I did the implementation is basically you just have a name, but it's not really mutable in the term of, like if you change, it's like a new service anyway. So I don't understand why, like what is interest of immutable? Because if you rename the service, it's still a new service. And the discovery, the way you match it, it's not gonna be the same anyway. So, because we, from the specification, the discovery is based on the name, or maybe I did the wrong implementation. And for the type, it's based on the type. So it's already kind of immutable in a, in a sense to me. So I think the scenario that I'm thinking of is, oh, we only have three minutes left. Um, tell you what, let, let's take this offline because I don't think we have time to dive into it deep. But I do think it's important that that receivers of this information be able to know when something changes metadata versus it vanished. Because I think as a, as a consumer of this information, I may need to do two different things, right? Because I may have my own customers who are using the service and they need to know whether their service just vanished. And then down they need to pick a new one to use or stop using it versus, oh, it, the metadata just changed its name. Therefore, everything still works. It's just when they go into the UI, it's going to have a different name there, right? Yeah. I do agree is uh, if you change the name, basically the subscription, you should automatically unsubscribe any clients in a way that, uh, because you made it disappear. So if well, I'm that's the, client, that's the problem though, right? That's the problem, yeah, right? Because yeah, yeah. if all you did is you change your name, but you don't want to disrupt any of your people who are subscribed to you, you, you definitely don't want to unsubscribe them, right? Because a simple name change should not screw up any existing subscriptions, at least yeah, in, in so my I, opinion. It, but uh, is it us to decide or just like the guy who implement and to take the decision? Uh, nope. I agree that it may be someone else's decision to make. We may, you know, we, we, we could choose to, to, <clears throat> to say something one way or the other in the spec. <clears throat> but if we leave it up to the implementation to decide, they still need a mechanism to be able to make that choice themselves. And if we don't give them a unique field that's immutable, they don't have a choice. And that's, that's, that's where I'm worried about. But anyway, we're, we're running out of time. We can talk about that through the issue itself. Okay, but thank you guys for the input. Um, let me think. Okay, that's it for the agenda. Before I go back and do roll call, any other topics you want to bring up very, very quickly? 
Okay, in that case, uh, we had some people drop, unfortunately. I don't think Sam's there anymore. I don't see Paris. Nick, are you there? Uh, yes, Nick. I'm here. Excellent, perfect. John, are you still there? Yeah. John? John? Yep. All right, and Manuel? Yes, I'm here. All right, how about um, Gustavo? Uh, Gustavo? Yes. Okay, excellent, cool. All right, did I miss anybody for roll call? All right, thank you, everybody. I guess I should have asked. Um, oh, I guess you did want to talk about your SDK stuff at the top of the, um, Remy wanted to talk about his thing. So, okay, yeah, so um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, we'll talk again in about a minute or so. Uh, we'll start up the SDK call. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Remy, I apologize. Is that hand that you have up, old or new? Uh, it's old, sorry. <laughs> okay, good. I, I assumed it was old, but I wasn't 100% sure. Yeah, I'm managing my daughter at the same time. Isn't that always easy? <laughs> yeah. Yes, child duty at the same time as taking phone calls is not easy sometimes. Okay. Do, 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 do. Holy crap, I can't type today. Any other topics people want to add to the list? Uh, not on my side. <laughs> I think I already spoke too much. Yeah. Well, that, that's a good question then. Is there anything else you want to talk about relative to your discovery PR? Uh, no, no, like, yeah. I okay. hope I help a little bit the community. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In that case, do we have anything to talk about at all? If not, we can adjourn after about a minute. Yeah, because, uh, yes, like, I don't know if, uh, yeah, I'll wait for Len to review and uh, <clears throat> I know that Grant uh, pushed something. I think we kind of talk about uh, including it in the SDK and we, for what I understood, we all agree that it's okay to integrate in the SDK for now. So. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Oh, and just to let you guys know, I haven't had a chance to investigate a security email address. I'll, I'll add that to the list to make sure I don't forget. Okay. Any other topics then? Otherwise, we're going to call it. Okay. <laughs> I think we're done. <laughs> I like short calls. Okay. Have a good day, everybody. Good Thank day. you for joining. Bye. Thanks, Doug. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye, people.